Welcome back to the Gentleman's Gazette. In today's video, we'll turn back time once again, looking more distinctly at the outfits and clothing of men in the 1940s. <laughs> Movies and TV series depict that era, but what did men really wear at the time, what clothing was available to them, and how did they wear it? In the first half of the 1940s, obviously World War II was raging, but even after, the impact of such a tragic worldwide event was still being felt and reflected in the clothing men wore. Rationing meant that fabrics were often unavailable. It also impacted the style of the clothing. There were new laws in the books that meant people couldn't just wear whatever they wanted. And even if they could buy something, there were limitations on that. Of course, there was also new social change that transformed menswear. In decades past, the high fashion was typically something led by the aristocracy. And the average man would look up to that and wanted to emulate that. But not anymore. With classes intermingling on the battlefield, a cultural shift had set in and aristocrats or the aristocracy in itself wasn't as highly regarded anymore. Men now had a new appreciation for life and for freedom and they just wanted to relax more and be themselves. In terms of clothing, that meant there was a surge in casual style garments that wasn't seen before. And as one might expect in a war period, what you wore also reflected on your patriotism. And so a lot of what we'll be talking about in this video is about rationing and the influence of military styles onto civilian clothing. So without further ado, let's start with the clothing men wore in the 1940s, starting from the top with the hats. Now, there wasn't really a new style of hat and the old styles were still around. Think about the Homburg hat, the fedora, the top hat, and even the bowler hat. Of course, the bowler, the Panama hat, and the flat cap were also still around in the 40s. What was different in the 40s was the distribution. Top hats were maybe worn in England or by the upper classes or maybe the middle upper class, but otherwise the fedora was definitely the most popular hat now, especially in the US. If you take a closer look at the hat, you can see British hats kept a relatively shorter brim and a stiffer felt, whereas in the US, the brim got wider and the felt got softer. If people didn't wear a fedora, the pork pie hat and the Homburg were also still quite popular. For example, you can see jazz musician Lester Young sporting a pork pie hat and here a Homburg by Winston Churchill. Now, while the hat was still very much a common sight, overall fewer men wore hats because hairstyles had become more important by now. When it comes to grooming hair and facial hair, 1940s men were very well groomed. You can see lots of photographs and movies from the time, the haircuts are all slick, glam, and sometimes shiny. The typical short back and sides with longer hair on top and pomade was definitely a look that was prevalent in the 30s as well as the 40s. Towards the end of the 40s, hair became more wavy and voluminous. Now, the pompadour hairstyle would become really popular in the 50s, but if you look at the late 40s, you can already see how it started taking shape then. Much like in the 30s, smaller moustaches and a clean-shaven hairstyle was popular in the 40s, and mostly older men would wear a beard. Of course, men serving the military had to shave and so they just continued that habit once they exited the military. In terms of eyewear and spectacles, the 1940s were very similar to the 30s. You had those rimless versions, you had bacalite or celluloid frames, and that's what men often wore. Of course, there were also horn spectacles or wireframe spectacles. Some even wore the pince nez, but typically those were older gentlemen. In terms of eyewear shape, the 40s had more variety. You had a more triangular shape with a dip at the bottom or a more square or rectangular shape. It wasn't just plain round anymore. New plastics and lens tinting also meant that people could have different hues in their sunglasses, which was a interesting form of the personalization. That option was around before, but it wasn't as popular until the 1940s. In the US, aviator glasses became really important because that's what they wore at the US Army Air Corps. Likewise, brow line glasses became popular after their invention in 1947, and they continue to be popular today. Believe it or not, but the monocle was still being worn by men in the 1940s. 
typically was associated with men in a higher social position. During the 1940s, the rimless monocle became incredibly popular in Germany with movie stars, the elite, and officers. It's said that that was an attempt to imitate British officers who had the round, gold-rimmed eyeglass or monocle. Thanks to the association with high-ranking Nazis, the 1940s were pretty much the decade that killed the monocle. Now, our scriptwriter and history buff, Aaron White, still wears a monocle on a daily basis. And if you want to see how he does it, check out his video here. Now, in terms of shirts, formal dress shirts were still the norm. And while older men would typically wear a separate, stiff collar, the soft collar shirts had also become more popular, especially in the United States. In the earlier half of the 1940s, very long collar tips, also called spear points, were rather popular. And then as the decade progressed, the collar spears became shorter. If the collars weren't buttoned down or being worn with a collar clip or a collar pin, they typically had collar stays that were removable and ensured a clean looking collar. Because that starching was no longer a requirement. Another somewhat more obscure type of collar was the trubonized collar, which was also popular in the 1940s. Trubonizing was basically a process whereas the fabric was fused with acetate on the back. It was patented in the 1930s in the US, and it just gave you that clean look without actually having to starch the collar. It also meant that you didn't need a collar clip anymore or a button-down collar to keep your collar looking neat. In the UK, in the House of Commons in 1945, there was even a discussion if demobilized men should be given tab collars or trubonized collars so it was easier for them to look the part. Frankly, I doubt many of the older politicians even had a clue what trubonized collars actually meant. Now, the rationing of fabric actually had a great impact on the design of dress shirts as we know them today. If you look at the 1900s, dress shirts were cut very roomy and much longer, sometimes reaching all the way down to your knee. Now, with limited fabric supply, the shirt became a bit trimmer and much shorter, ending somewhere around your upper thigh area. Of course, in the same thing, French cuffs were now forbidden because single cuffs did the same job and required less fabric. If you watched our other videos, you know that striped shirts were very popular with a common man. Well, now with the advancement in technology, you also had block patterns or small micro patterns. Even dotted shirts would be something men would wear. Apart from the formal dress shirts, casual shirts really became big in the 1940s. There were many types and different patterns and colors, but the camp style collar was definitely something we owe to the 1940s. So what's a camp collar? Basically, it is a soft, unstarched collar that doesn't have a stand. It's meant to be worn unbuttoned, and you can typically find it on casual shirts. It was also popular in the 70s, and you can see them again now when men want to be casual with their printed Hawaiian shirts, for example. Which brings us to the Hawaiian shirts, which were brought back to the mainland US by the GIs. In 1947, the Hawaiian Chamber of Commerce introduced Aloha Week. That meant that men were encouraged to wear Aloha shirts instead of suits to the office. Later, it became Aloha Friday and then Casual Friday. So did men even wear neckwear or ties if all these casual shirts were around? Well, yes, they did even though not so with those casual shirts, more with formal dress shirts. That being said, there were also more leisurely shirts that allowed for a tie. Of course, there also was a shortage of silk, so ties were impacted by that, and different materials became popular, such as wool, cotton, or rain. Ties also became thinner and shorter. On average, a tie was about 10 inches or 25 centimeters shorter than ties are today. Some said ties were simpler. I'd argue that some of those ties were pretty bold. That geometric patterns, crazy spirals, or interesting color combinations. After the war was over, ties became a lot wider, up to five inches or 12 and a half centimeters in width. Now, custom hand painted ties with your hobby, such as fish, or maybe a attractive woman or other things in your life became popular. And even though that had been around since the 20s, the 40s was really the time when those kind of ties took off. 
Frankly, most of these ties are too outlandish for my taste, but each to his own. It was basically an opportunity for men to express themselves and add their club insignia, maybe their university, or just personalize something about them and manifest it in their neckwear. Those bold kind of designs were also reflected in the pocket squares, which were likewise very outlandish. Even though bow ties were still around and you'd wear them for black tie, overall, the necktie was quite a bit more popular than bow ties. 1940s waistcoats were very similar to 1930s vests in the sense that they had a V neckline and pointed tips at the bottom for the single breasted version. And single breasted waistcoats were by far more popular than double breasted ones. Typically, they had six buttons and they would have three or four pockets. Of course, many men also went without waistcoats because they were no longer necessary at the office. And of course, there was rationing, so it was easy to skip the waistcoat. Before the popularization of central heating, men would sometimes even wear a waistcoat underneath a double-breasted suit. But in the 1940s, that time was pretty much over and you no longer wore waistcoats typically with a double-breasted suit. Instead of a vest, some people also decided to wear a jumper or a knit vest, which became popular in the 40s. Fair Island centered patterns or cool, unusual knit patterns were popular then. So what went over those knit vests? Well, a jacket, of course. Typically, the jacket or suit colors were more somber, included black, dark gray, charcoal, brown, navy, and so forth. Herringbone tweeds such as Donegal, overplets, and checks, just the typical classical pattern you know today, were also around then. They had lots of interesting stripes though, pinstripes or chalk stripes, and sometimes different double stripes were really popular. If you wanna learn more about all the different kinds of stripes, check out this video here. Of course, jackets were also hit by the fabric rationing in the UK, and there were austerity regulations about the jacket in the US. From 1942 onwards in the US, jackets could no longer have flaps. So you had jacket pockets or patch pockets instead in order to save fabric. That being said, if you flip through old catalogs from the era, you can still see some models with flaps. Now in the UK, things were a bit stricter. Starting in 1941, belted backs, pleated backs, half belt backs, zips, and double-breasted jackets were altogether banned. Suits were limited to having three pockets and they needed moderately sized lapel widths. So you couldn't have these typically wide 30 style lapels. As most of the wool fabric was used for military uniforms at the time, civilian clothing was typically made out of a blend of wool and rayon. In terms of the jacket silhouette and the suit, it was overall boxier than a suit today. It had shoulder padding, which created a broader manly look and the waist was cut a bit more boxy, the interlining was stiffer, the fabrics were heavier, and it had a certain presence. Whereas today, jackets are often lightweight, they don't have shoulder pads, and just a very different structure. Today it's all about softness. Back then, it was much more structured and stiff, inspired by the military uniforms, which also had that going for them. Now, if you go through pictures from the 1940s, you sometimes see men wearing suits that look distinctly 1930s. Well, that was because it was considered to be patriotic to wear your old suits rather than using new material for the new style. In that same vein, many men now didn't just wear a suit, but they combined their suit jackets with different trousers, and so the odd jacket combination outfit became more popular in the 40s. Obviously, the advantages were twofold. On the one hand, you were supporting the war effort, and on the other, you had more options with your limited amount of clothing, because if you had three jackets and three pants, that was already nine different outfits. If you're interested how you can put together very interesting looking combinations with what you already have in your wardrobe, check out this video on the Spezzato style. Now for that reason, the sport coat as you know it today with a louder pattern, was popularized in the 1940s. Yes, you had a navy blazer, but you also had a bold houndstooth jacket or maybe a window pane one. Overall, jackets were also relatively short compared to the previous decade. And later on in the 40s, when rationing disappeared, the jackets became longer again and a little wider because now designers and tailors could do the things they wanted to without any limitations from the outside. In the US, double-breasted suits weren't outlawed and towards 
the later part of the decade, you could see a lot of men wearing double-breasted suits. Typically, they had wide shoulders with padding and the rather boxy cut. At least, that's what a 40s double-breasted suit is known for today. Typically, you had a six by two button configuration, which means you had six overall buttons with the top row being wider stanced and then two rows at the bottom that would be bottomed. Now, sometimes the top row of buttons all disappeared, so you had a four by two double-breasted coat. The gorge of those jackets was at about the same height as it was in the 30s, which is much lower than what you see today. That being said, 1940s double-breasted jackets have a very distinct look that was very different to, let's say, the 1920s, for example. To learn more about that decade, check out the video here. When we talk about 1940s trousers, we have to bring up the austerity regulations first. The opening couldn't be wider than 19 inches doubled up, which is nine and a half inches measured flat, or about 24 centimeters. These rules were ignored by some youth of the era, and even though they came from many backgrounds, many of them came from black, Filipino, or Mexican communities. They wore the so-called zoot suits, which was an oversized jacket that was cut extremely full. It was very long, and likewise, the trousers were also very full cut. And because of that, they used up a lot of fabric. There were many who considered those zoot suits to be unpatriotic because of this excess fabric that was used to make them. Now, for many young men who felt alienated by the mainstream in the US, this kind of zoot suit was the ability to express their disdain for the good American taste. It was a revolt against the established order using the zoot suit as a symbol for self-determination and pride. It definitely inspired sup and countercultures that were to come in later decades. Now, this defiant sartorial stance, in combination with a ubiquitous racism of the era, led to the Zoot Suit Riots in 1943. Of course, there's a lot more history to Zoot Suits, and we believe it warrants its own video, so stay tuned. In the UK, trousers had similar restrictions than in the US, and to get around that, men would buy longer trousers and just had them hemmed at home. Zips and elastic waistbands were also banned, and by the mid to late 1940s, double pleated trousers were in style. The flat front trouser was still around, but not as popular anymore. Looking at the illustrations and photos of the era, it looks like most pleats faced inward. By this time, most trousers were straight-waisted and had belt loops. Now, in the UK, fishtails for braces or suspenders could still be found. In the US, the belt had taken over. Overall, the rise of trousers was much higher and pants were cut much fuller. After the war was over, a cuff about two inches or five centimeters was the fashion. Another defining feature of the 1940s is the so-called Hollywood waistband, which we cover in more detail in our 1930s video here. Basically, the Hollywood waistband doesn't have a true waistband, and the belt loops are sometimes set down about an inch or two centimeters to create a very different look from a trouser with waistbands. In terms of footwear, you can probably guess by now that those were also rationed. As leather and rubber was in high demand for the war effort, people actually had coupons that they needed in order to buy a pair of shoes. To combat this, many people bought second-hand shoes, and so you could see lots of 1920s and 30s style shoes or boots being worn by men in the 1940s. If you were lucky enough to get your hands on a pair of new shoes, the styles were very similar to the 1930s. That meant the toe shape was somewhat pointed but rounded. The art of the shoes was typically higher, and so was the heel. Broke two-tone Oxfords in gray, black, brown, and white were quite popular. If you want to learn more about spectators or the correspondence shoe, check out this video here. Even though a lot more men in the 1940s wore two-tone or spectator shoes, there were also plenty of men who wore plain black or brown shoes. Inspired by the war and the utilitarian mindset, more men had also turned to boots again rather than shoes. Shoes that were previously only one for sporting, such as the Converse Chuck Taylor All-Stars, now also were worn by men in a more casual nature outside of sports. No, they weren't worn with suits like some men do today. They were still reserved for very, very casual outings. Nothing more than that. Once shoes became more available again, men liked 
loafers and slippers as they were more comfortable. They were also used for house shoes at home made of kid skin leather or deer leather because they were soft, comfy, and new. And unlike a pair of boots that you had to tie and it took some time to get in, a pair of loafers was put on rather easily. In terms of accessories, smoking was still very prevalent in the 1940s, and so men could have their tobacco, their pipe, their cigar case, or anything else related to smoking. Wristwatches had taken over from the pocket watch and were the norm these days, especially in the US. Pocket watches were typically something worn only by older men. In fact, after the war, spending money on jewelry and accessories was considered to be patriotic because it was supporting the economy. Because of that, many men could be seen with bold wristwatches or rings or cufflinks or other jewelry. Sets with flasks and tie bars, for example, were popular. That being said, leather gloves and scarves were also still widely worn and for a vintage-inspired selection of scarves and gloves, you can check out the selection in our shop here or watch a few videos about them. Overall, scarves in the 40s had more colors than a typical scarf today, small paisley patterns, different colored fringes, and they were quite dapper. While braces or suspenders were still being worn by few select old men, the belt really had cemented its position as the number one pants accessory for men. Eventually, that would feed into a cowboy fad where men, inspired by watching Western movies, would pick up Western clothes elements in their everyday wardrobe. In a nutshell, what you saw in the 1940s was definitely different and more progressive than what had been around previously. Because of the war, the austerity regulations, and rationing, you definitely had an impact on the style of the era. Also, I'd say the quality of the materials at the time weren't the highest. What men really wore then was often not a true representation of what was produced in the 1940s, because you wore old boots and secondhand clothing to support the war, and sometimes that's all you could get your hands on. If you're interested to learn what men really wore in different decades of years gone by, let us know in the comments and we'll try to expand the series. In today's video, I'm not wearing a 1940s outfit because I don't have many 1940s suits. Instead, I chose a modern blazer that had somewhat slimmer lapels. It doesn't have the typical strong shoulder padding, but overall the navy blazer was still something that you could find in the 1940s. My pants are cut a bit trimmer, they don't have cuffs, and they're gray, and they're in line with what men could have worn. My shirt is white. It has a collar that is not too spread. It doesn't have a spear point collar, but it's a very classic collar. My tie is very 1940s inspired. It has these bold patterns. It is printed on silk, but the silk is also woven. It's just something that I thought was fun. My pocket square is a plain white pocket square that is linen. It's from Fort Belvedere and you can find it in our shop here, just like my orange and blue socks. And no, that's not something men would have worn in the 1940s, but with this tie, I thought it would go well together. My shoes are black Oxfords that are semi-brogues and they're very uneventful. I pair them with a black belt from Fort Belvedere and a gold buckle so it matches my little pinky ring as well as my cufflinks. Yes, I know men didn't wear cufflinks because the single barrel cuff would also do, but hey, I love cufflinks. <laughs>